Hello, and welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I'll be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open our studios to the public. For more information, you can go to the website svos.org. Our guest is Ruth Waters, a sculptor whose works include beautiful abstract hardwood sculptures. She is also the founder and director of the Peninsula Museum of Art in Burlingame. She's here to demonstrate her wood carving techniques. Welcome, Ruth. Well, thank you, Sally. I'm delighted to be here. And just for beginners, I, beginnings, I brought two small pieces that I usually take to schools when I do demos because the wood is so silky to the touch. And I think it's okay to touch. It's central. Well, yeah. Now, the this piece is... you're holding is an impressionist version of a cat. And what's significant about it is that it is carved in a piece of Macassar ebony. Now, Macassar ebony is something you will not find locally. And it is an ebony variety that grows in the Macassar Straits off of the east coast of Africa. And nowadays, it's very, very difficult to actually get these fine, exotic, tropical oh, I'm woods. Oh, sure. Yes. It's beautiful. It looks almost like tiger's eye, like the yeah. stone. Oh, yes. Very layered yes. And, and if you gorgeous. feel it, it's just, it's a very oh, fine-grained yes. wood. Now, I brought this piece along because it was, I was given a piece of a persimmon tree, and a persimmon tree is a relative of ebony. So I is thought, it? aha, a gorgeous wood. Well, it's very nice wood, but I like the form. But it's not a pretty wood, not like the Macassar right. ebony. Definitely so different color. My solution was, when I finished it, to take it to the bronze foundry and ask them to make a mold and cast it in bronze. And so I did, and they did. And it's right behind you. So that's this one here yes. on this beautiful stand. There you are. Very nice. And I know that's not the color you expect from bronze, no. but the patina artist who works for the foundry does exquisite work. And that is his personal special formula. Oh, nice. So who knows what, how he does it. I watched him do it. And I couldn't tell you. He just sprays this and turns it and sprays something else. and sprays and all of a sudden, it looks like that. Wow, well, it's beautiful. So, it really I'm is. very pleased with it. But if you feel, if you feel how silky that is. Oh, yes. So how do you get it so silky? Oh, you sand forever. Sanding. <laughs> it doesn't beautiful. just happen. Oh, no. But it only happens with very fine-grained, closed-grained, wonderful woods. Uh, like oak would not feel like this. No. Just different. Just different. Yeah. So. Tell us a little bit about your background, just briefly. How did you get involved with carving? Well, uh, I was a Stanford student and, I, and graduate, but I was not an art major. And I took a couple of elementary drawing and composition classes, but when I tried to take the sculpture class as a senior, they wouldn't let me in because I was not an art major. Oh, no. So, Anyway, well, so then did they know. I was out working for Sunset Magazine, and one weekend I was up in San Francisco bumming around the galleries, and one on Sutter Street, I remember walking in, and of course it was all paintings, and I turned around to leave, and here was a nice big sculpture carved in wood, and I looked at that and said, I can do that. So I tracked down tools and started out. Wow. So, you know. Innocent and, <laughs> and you've not been knowing any better. <laughs> doing it ever since, and you do yeah, beautiful that's work. That's a long time ago. So you brought some images of your studio and some of your larger sculptures that are there. Oh, yes. So let's take a look at those now. <laughs> you know, I brought a few that look large, but these are a lot bigger. And we'll, we'll get a close-up of the one in the middle of there. It's called the Whirlwind. The one on the right is made of a, a modesto ash wood, and it's about eight feet tall. Wow. And on the walls behind, I, I do some painting, but I don't consider myself a painter. But the, the one in the middle there that kind of looks sort of mushroomy, 
uh, when you see it, it's behind me over here somewhere. Uh, what I found particularly interesting about it is that the log had been a cherry tree that was grafted. You know how they graft right. different fruits on? Mm -hmm. Well, this was a cherry tree, and I can see where the cherry tree was allowed to have one major branch to stay cherries. But the other three branches were grafted to peach and plum and apricot. Interesting. And so different color woods inside one yes, piece. But you see, the DNA is correct because they're all stone fruits so that oh. the, the grafts would take. Like you can graft apples and pears together because they have the same DNA for, we think about the insides of the seeds and things. Right. So when you create these, you start with a tree trunk and then oh, you, yeah. what is your technique to get it <laughs> to look like that? I mean, do well, you start with the idea? Yeah, I'll strip the bark off, see if I've got any obvious problems. You know, always want to find out the bad news first. And then I think about it until I have a clear image in my mind. And I get the chalk out, make some lines on it, and then I start carving. But I have to know where I'm going before I start carving. Because once it's cut, it's gone. Right. There's no going back. It's, no, it's all subtractive. So that's the way it is. And then it's carve, 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 and make a mess. And <laughs> <laughs> And eventually you get to where you're rasping and filing and smoothing down the surface because the tools, you'll see in a minute the tools I use, they're curved, they're called gouges. They're chisels, but they're called gouges because they cut a curved uh, surface. So there you can see some more of the studio. And on the left, halfway down the, the scene there on the left is the twisted pillar, which is behind me and you'll see it shortly. We brought that one in, and that is carved out of podocarpus wood. And a podocarpus tree, you probably don't know the name of it, but no. it, it's a commonly used landscape and, and, and street tree. Oh. And they were trimming back a huge, huge tree in the neighborhood, and so I said, uh, can I have that? <laughs> and they kind of looked at me strangely. It wasn't the Daily Tree Company guys. They, you know, they all know me. So it was just a block from my art center and I went and got my hand truck and trundled it up and picked up the log and took it back to the studio. So now that one is just outside in the hallway and it's quite large. It's carved in madrone and it's the darkest color of madrone I've ever wow, had. But the theme is the family because there's three abstracted figures. Two that have a suggestion of a head up at the top and the third that you can just barely see in the middle Right. That's the child who has grown up and is leaving, but Aww. still attached because you are yes. always connected to your family. So I, I like people. Uh, I'm interested always in relationships and, and interactions and things like that. And I, I've returned to that theme in a number of ways. Yeah. Well, now here we're looking along one side of the studio you have back a lot towards of the workroom. Sculptures in your studio. Ah, uh, yes. Well, uh, too many. <laughs> but hidden along the side there is a piece that you'll see eventually called uh, the Demagogue. And it's sitting here. I don't know if you can get a shot of that yet, but. We will. It's a. Uh, carved in black walnut. It was originally a three-piece three sculpture that I called Portrait of Power. Oh. And I didn't, I finished it, I didn't like it, I took it apart, saved the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the central part, and resurrected it as the demagogue. And it's, but you can't see that now, okay. What we're looking at now is in my workshop and on the bench is a piece I'm working on for a wall sculpture, and it's carved in Brazilian rosewood, which is one of the three hardest, densest woods known in the world. Is that all from one piece? It's, it was one huge slab. Wow. And it's carved. I'm now <laughs> sanding, and that just, it take, the finishing takes as long as the carving does. Wow. It just is a long process. But I did keep, leave several parts of the design 
with the carved surface because I, I, it kind of pleases me that people can see that and feel that an actual human hand actually carved right. the wood. So. And there's your and workbench. That's, that's the workbench with the piece on it that I brought for a demo tonight. And it's an odd little piece. It was a part of a, a stack of logs that were donated. And I have no idea even. Let me go here. Yes. I don't even know who gave them to us. They dumped them and left. Well, but you're going to give us a demonstration of your <laughs> techniques now. So let's take a look at so Ruth in action. OK, I'm on now. Yes. See, there's the twisted pillar. So. These are the tools. I, I use this one, the number five gouge, gouge meaning it's a curved cutting edge. Probably does 85% of the carving work. And my mallet is a lignum vitae mallet, which means it's heavy. I've been working with this for probably 25, 30 years. And it's showing some wear, but not a whole lot. And are you ready? I'm noisy. <laughs> Now what I'm doing with this piece is I'm rounding this surface. It's an odd piece. It was a you know a, a thrown away slab. Uh, this will be the flat. I'm going to keep this flat. The, this side has to be rounded back to the flat side. And the theme is terra infirma or stick earth. And at the museum, we have a show coming up this, in a couple months. I think it starts in May, called Terra Infirma, about ecological and environmental issues. So when I found this piece, with you see how this is a split here. Right. There's flaws here, and and look, at, if if you were slicing open the earth, and you would find serious serious issues, because we have volcanoes, right, among other things, <laughs> volcanoes, and earthquakes, tectonics. and violent stuff. Well, this poor thing will, uh, and see here, there's disease, critical stuff. So your sculpting part of it, what, how, do you already know what it's going to look like at the end? It's pardon me? Do you know what it's going to look like at the end? Oh, yes. The, okay. Oh, yes. This will, this will all be very smooth, curved back to here. And I, I'm pretty sure the wood is English brown oak. It has the very distinctive oak configuration of the, of the wood fibers themselves. But it was a very big old tree. It was sick. That's why it was cut. You can see this and streaking in here. And then, of course, this was where it divided. It would have grown like, like this. Ah. So this would have been a huge trunk going here and, a, and the main trunk going up here. So you become intimately familiar with each piece of wood and every grain and where it's going, yeah. how it works together. Very so and here you can see with the disease here. So I'll be working on this for a while. It's very, it's, I don't know if you've picked it up and lifted it up, but it's, it's heavy, it's dense. It's, it's right. not a simple wood to work with. But when it's finished, I think it'll be kind of spectacular and on a very contemporary theme. Yes. Unfortunately, we have to deal with these issues. But this will all get smoothed out and curved back and So what tools and pretty. would you use to smooth it after the gouge? Oh, smoothing. Oh, yes. Well, to go from the carved surface to a sanding surface, I use sureform planes. And that, think of a cheese grater. It slices, little tiny slicing, slices off, makes a mess. But because the tools have curved surfaces, it means you've got this kind of a surface. Right. So you want to get that all down flat and smooth. And then it's sanding. And I have my piece of leather. And I'll start with usually 60 grit open coat garnet paper. And it just, uh, uh, you know, forever. <laughs> so I'll go through five or six different layers of sandpaper to get down to a silky smooth, Lovely finish. So what and is then your, it's raw linseed oil. What does your sandpaper stroke look like? Because is I, what? 
What does it look like when you're sandpapering? Can you show us the techniques that you use a little bit? Well, oh, true. I, I'm taking some froze over granite. I didn't even think about it. But you always sand with the grain. With the grain meaning the direction in which the tree grew. So we'll make believe that this is ready to sand. You see, I will have already taken some of the, I will have smoothed it down. Right. And then I'll start with the sandpaper. And this is many hours of work, Oh, right? yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> and then it goes through to very, very fine sandpaper. But there's a 220. When I, when I finish the 220, then I'm ready to oil the whole thing. What type of oil do you use? The hand, hand rubbed linseed oil, raw linseed oil, not the boiled. And it's, uh, and then some woods take only one coat, some take four or five to build up a nice glowing finish. The one over there is looking pretty good. Uh, so you, I have to keep track of what you can see on the, on the monitor there. But it's, it's a long, slow process. There's, there's really no way of speeding it up. Right. People always ask me, well, don't you use power tools? Well, power tools are wonderful for soft woods and for cutting straight lines and polishing flat surfaces. Right. Now, show me the straight lines and the flat surfaces. <laughs> there are none. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. So, so that's what I do. But I hope that people can come to our open studios because we'll all be in our studios working away and yes. greeting people and being happy to see them. So let's take a look at some of your completed sculptures. You brought okay. some more images for us. Transcendence. Tell us about this one. Now let's see. That's... What type of wood is it? That one, that's the eight foot tall Modesto ash. Now on the left is, what is that? I can't see it clearly enough which one it is. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah, that was a Koa wood piece, one of the Intimacy series. And back behind uh, is mostly paintings. So but the one that's curved behind it, how do you get that to balance? Is that something that you have to put into the design when yeah. you're carving? And you have that already <laughs> in mind. I'm amazed that you have such well, a plan for each piece. Yeah, you, you have to. It's, there's nothing casual about it. Right. No, I, I understand. Once you, if you make a mistake, <laughs> it's a smaller sculpture. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, different, it's a different world, and I've come to realize that it it is different, and most of my students come to me because they understand this. Once in a while, I have someone who, whose mind doesn't work that way, and it's very difficult for them. Yeah, but I can imagine. That's the way it is. So, yeah, so let's look at another one. Oh, that one, okay. Now, that's olive wood, and that's in the... Uh, uh, lower floor display area of the Burning Game Library. I call it blossoming. So it was the bottom of, a, of an olive tree with where all these branches went out, and it was, uh, that was fun to do. How big is that across, approximately? Pardon me? How big is it oh. across? Oh, it's, it's about three feet across. Wow, and that was from one big trunk? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was... Oh, okay. That's the demagogue. That's the one that started out as three pieces, and I called it a portrait of power. But what I really liked was the middle piece, and I kept that. And it's black walnut. You can't quite see all the details, but the ears and the eyes are empty holes. The mouth is protruding as if it's yelling. Yes. And the whole center of the log is empty. It was <laughs> like a demagogue. <laughs> well, yes, well, yes. 
Um, <laughs> and it's not smooth like your no, other sculptures. It's, it's a very just carved. different style. Yeah. yeah, carved. And I, I just went over it lightly with the very, very, very fine sandpaper, just taking little sharp edges off and oiled it. But black walnut is a lovely wood to work with. And it used to be that you could drive up Highway 99 way back when that was the only way you could go north. Right. And there's miles of, of walnut orchards. And the walnut trees, the English walnut stock was grafted onto black walnut root stock oh. because it was hardier. Right. And they grafted it about four or five feet off the ground. Oh. Well, that was wonderful because when the tree got very, very old and they cut it down, you had a, all that wonderful black walnut wood. Now they do their grafting two inches off the ground. Oh, not Fat the chance for you know. Right. So it's gotten very hard to very hard to find. And that oh that's yeah that's a fun one. That's intimacy one, the first one I did on that theme. And there's another shot of that that shows a little more of the detail. Yeah. Can you see how the two forms are interrelated? Yes. Okay, well that was chosen by a curator for an exhibition at the Rockefeller Center Gallery in New York City. I thought, oh boy. Yay. And then I got a call from the curator and she said, you aren't going to believe this, but the gallery manager says your piece is too erotic to show in New what? York. <laughs> and <laughs> and I mean, it's just do, you know? two wooden twists. Yeah. That's so anyway, funny. people see what they're looking for. I guess so. And so, but I thought, well, that's that must be a pretty good piece. And so I took it to the foundry, and they made a mold. And I have sold seven of the bronzes from that, and oh, I have excellent. the eighth one in my studio. <laughs> Wonderful. And that was the beginning of a dynasty of intimacy pieces. Is intimacy, there's intimacy too. So this is a bronze yeah. as well. Now that was carved in a maple tree and cast in bronze. And there's intimacy four. And that's a wall piece. It's about five feet tall and carved in uh, Honduras mahogany. And you're probably used to seeing Honduras mahogany at very high end furniture. Yes. Yeah. So. I, I, as you can see, I like people. I think in relationships are right. very important, and and I have fun with it too. So when you're doing a wall sculpture like this, is there a different approach that you take? Do you ha you must start with a thinner piece of wood, for example? Well, I start with a slab. A slab instead yeah. of a trunk. But I still have to visualize what I want. And then the the next step then is to pick up the piece of chalk and start to make lines on the, the wood. And then I start carving. So you do sketch out at first? Well, sort of. I, I don't use paper because, well, this is, the, this is closer to drawing than the logs. But right. with the log, you see that's three-dimensional, and paper is two-dimensional. Right. It's hard to. So it doesn't accomplish much to draw on paper. But I'll, I'll take the chalk and work with the whole log all the way around. So you have a lot of experience carving all of these beautiful woods. Oh yeah. Does each wood have its own person, you know, personality or Absolutely. texture and you have to know how to work each one? You have to relate to it. Yeah. It's absolutely they're different. Just different. Well Can look you, at how different Right. They're different these two are. but when you're carving them yeah, do you and, use a different technique? Well, and, and these, these two are both very fine-grained, sleek woods. Compared to oak, which is open-grained. Right. And, well, and even mahogany is open-grained. Hmm. They, they feel different. You know, when people come into my studio, if there's children, the adults will say, now don't touch, don't touch. <laughs> and I'll say, no, wait a minute. Clean skin oil is good for the wood. Oh. Peanut butter and jam, not so. No. <laughs> and so they run across the hallway and wash their hands and come back and say, okay, can I touch? Because right. touch is one of the five basic senses. Oh, yeah. It's very important. I want them to learn to be able to touch and feel and so. understand the difference in, in how the different woods feel. It's just... Yeah. And so when you're using your tools, do you use them 
any differently at all with the different woods? No, it's just that, well, yes, I do. For the very hard woods, I have a heavier mallet. Oh. And so that gives, you know, with, with a strike, there's more inertial weight hitting. Right. Yeah. So which wood would be the hardest? I don't know. Well, the Gabon ebony, lignum vitae, and Brazilian rosewood are tied for top. Oh, so that huge yes. flat wall yes. structure yes. is the hardest. Yes, and I used my big, big mallet. mallet for that one. And, it's, and it looks so delicate. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> so tell us where people can see your art and what upcoming oh, well. shows you have. Okay. The best place is to come to the Peninsula Museum of Art up in Burlingame. If you know where the Mills Peninsula Hospital is, you're close. This heads straight towards the railroad tracks on Trillsdale. And when you spot the, the Burlingame Police Department, find one of the two driveways into the parking area. Right. And we're inside the block behind the police department. And now that's a pretty safe place for an art museum. <laughs> and for your, you have big signs out for oh, the yeah. open studios oh, yeah. and the big yellow SVOS signs will yeah. direct people there. Oh, and, and, we and love when, it. when people come to the Peninsula Museum of Art, what will they see at an open studios? Well, you'll see, of course, the, the five museum galleries will be gorgeous, mm -hmm. but also we have 29 professional artists in studios, 29 studios, mm -hmm. 30, one sharing deal, 30 uh, artists in there, plus a classroom. And you can walk through all of that. All we have 19,000 square feet of oh, art. It's a beautiful building. I've been there several times. Yeah, I yeah. love to go there. Yeah, it's, and your studio is part of that. And you'll yes. be there displaying yeah. your art. Well, and it, it, the museum, of course, is a 501c3 nonprofit, and the art in the museum galleries on the exhibitions, that's not for sale, although we make sure that people can get in touch with the artist if they would like to buy something. Okay. But well, not through the museum. Your art is phenomenal. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for coming to Talk Art and showing us your work. Well, I'm delighted, and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone at Silicon Valley Open, Open Studios. Open Studios, Party me too. Time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> thank you so much, Sally. You're welcome.